God is relational through His revealing of Himself. Have you ever thought that we wouldn't know anything about God unless He actually showed up and did something? Like, we would just be here. God made the first move in revealing Himself to us. And here it says, you have seen what the Lord did. You have literally seen what God has done in your life. You've seen it. You see God, Romans tells us we see God through the creation, that we are without excuse because we see God and He's made these beautiful mountains and waterfalls and all these things. God is relational because He took that step and to show us who He is. He's revealed Himself to us. Otherwise, we'd have no idea. We just have our, our own imaginations of what God would be like. But He took that step. Moses continues in, in verse 5, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who then, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him, and what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? God's relational through His rewarded blessings. He's relational through His revelation of who He is. But He's relational through His rules. Like, we don't think of that. We think of the rules in the Bible as like constricting us, you know. Like, you know, it's Christianity. It's just all these rules you got to follow. God's just trying to he's take them away from my happiness. And, but if we really take a second and we look at these rules and laws in Scripture, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie. Could you imagine what the world would look like if all people followed these rules? How much better of a place would it be? God's relational through His rules in that He desires the best for you. You know, we're, he didn't set these rules just to, to make us uh, bored or, you know, not get to have fun. He's relational through these rules. Um, it, it's revealing his character. It's revealing his perfection, his standard. And, and it's revealing uh, how we should live our lives. So, laid out all these sort of things that, that Israel should see about what God has done. And now it changes gears. This is where it changes gears. And now Moses is saying, okay, let me direct this to you. Okay? Let's pray before we continue. God, we pray that you would bring clarity to the Scripture, Lord. Lord, we pray uh, that you would move me out of the way completely. God, that, that you would cast me aside and that it would be your words and your words alone, God. God, I pray for the people in this room, God, that we would open our ears to what you have to say and that we would apply it in our lives. God, I pray that we would see that you are relational, Lord. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your Holy Spirit to enable us to have services like this. In Jesus' name, amen. So Moses turns in the direction now. Verse 9, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget. There's that. And Moses knows, right? He knows people. He knows that they hear about God and they see His blessings. They see how He reveals Himself. And yet, we're so easily distracted. All of us are like, ADD. You ever, you know, everyone heard of like ADD and you, you see the dog that's like squirrel. You know what I mean? Like we all have that in us. We're distracted. We forget. And so he says, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. Keep that in mind, saw no form. There was only a voice and he declared to you this covenant, which he commanded you to perform that is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at the time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. He's saying, do you remember when there were like this mountain and fire and smoke and God was there and he spoke to you? Remember that because there's going to come a time where something's going to come into your life and you're going to forget. And you know why you're going to forget is because you didn't have form. Why in the world does it say that? But saw no form. 
We see, we see that as a problem within Israel. They want a God that's containable. They, they, they want to have an object of worship that they can move around. They want to be able to see God. You know, they have in, in Exodus 32, they make a golden calf and they put it up there on, on like a podium and they begin to worship it. They, they beg God in 1 Samuel and they say, hey, we want a king to rule us that we can see, that can direct us and guide us. And, and we're like that sometimes, right? If God really wants to have a relationship with me, why doesn't he just come down on earth to where we all can see him and rule on a throne like a king? That would make sense. If he really wants a relationship with me, come on down here. And that's the way Israel has this mentality of they want a God with a form, something they can see, they can grasp. And, and I say, thank God that God doesn't do that. The reason we don't have God in a form, that, I mean, can you imagine a golden calf and be like, well, let's pack up camp. Well, here, grab God. We'll take him with us. <laughs> God is not something that we can contain into a form. God is so powerful, glorious, omnipresent, that he is able to have a unique relationship with each and every one of you simultaneously at the same time. That's wonderful. I don't have to share God. I don't have to wait in line in, in front of a throne. I don't have to wait and say, okay, I've got to schedule an appointment. Like, I have got all of God right here to me, specifically, personally, relationship. God is relational. Do not let the fact that God, we do not see the form of God hinder your relationship. Let it increase that relationship. Let you understand that in, in Moses, when he said, God, show me your glory, God said, you're going to have to hide behind a rock because if you saw who I am totally, you would go mad or die. God is so glorious that he doesn't have a form for us to see in this flesh, in this sinful nature. So, we all have skewed views of God and is relational. We say that God is either too big to care. We say that he is this, this big, massive God far, far away and he's looking at the world like it's, like it's a map or like it's a, a monopoly game and he's knocking people over or whatever and he's just, but, but he's too big to care about our small problems. Or we say God's too small. God's too busy to deal with what I've got going on. He's too busy to talk with me all the time. He's, I mean, think about all the God stuff he's got to do instead of talking to me. But that's not the biblical view of God. The biblical view of God is He is personal, He is relational, and He is specific to you. He loves you. You are His masterpiece. So, this is not the God of the Bible. We see, uh, <clears throat> we see that God goes to great lengths to reveal Himself. I mean, I mean, look at the Bible. Think about the lengths in which God has, has, has went to show you who He is. We all, we all study in science and we're like, why in the world is there so much universe? Like he just kept creating and creating and creating. He's going to such great lengths to help you understand how big he is. To help you understand how beautiful he is. At youth camp we set up uh, this thing called, called email. Not like on the computer, but it was encouragement mail. Um, it's just a week long youth camp. We got middle schoolers and high schoolers in. So along the walls we have envelopes with their names on them. And, and throughout the week, you're supposed to write letters to each other, um, encouraging each other. And so you have, you know, it was, it was great to sit and be, be before supper time, and I'd just kind of be sitting in the sanctuary area where the envelopes are, and a little middle school boy would come up and be like, look in his envelope. And son, when there was a paper in there, I mean, his face lit up. Like somebody thought enough about me to write me a letter specific to me. Wow. And, and I'm saying, I'm saying, that's this. God did that. It's not a little envelope. I mean, we've got the whole letter of God to us in this book, specific to us, encouraging us, showing us who He is, revealing Himself to us, how we should live. It's wonderful. But yet we don't react in that same happiness, that same, that same glee that, wow, He took the time to do that? We're talking about a king of kings that took the time to write, write this letter. And so, it, it, we, we see this truth that God is definitely relational. And, and we continue on in verse 15. <laughs> in verse 15, a lot of reading today, hoping y'all stay, staying awake. <clears throat> verse 15, it starts out with, Therefore, 
And that's of course always important in scripture because so it's like in light of everything that we just said, therefore this. So in light of, in light of the fact that, that God has blessed you, he's revealed himself to you, he's given you laws, and the fact that you guys forget all the time, <laughs> therefore this. Watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish is in the water under the earth, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, you will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he swore I should not cross the Jordan and that I not enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over and take possession of that land. Verse 23. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord. Take care lest you forget this salvation, this, this promise that God has given you, and turn to anything else. For satisfaction. Take care. Do not turn to anything else because God is jealous. Truth number one, God is relational. Truth number two, God is a jealous God. That's an interesting concept because jealousy we, we think of bad, but we see it all the time in Scripture. We see Nahum 1 2, the Lord is jealous and avenging. Zephaniah 1 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of wrath of the Lord in the fire of his jealousy. James 4, 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? What does that mean? How can God be jealous? Isn't that a sin? What, that doesn't make sense. How can God be jealous? Well, see, we are jealous for that which we do not deserve. Therefore, it is a sin. God is jealous for that which he does deserve. Therefore, it's not a sin. Jealousy implies a deep relationship. When we think of jealousy, what do we think of, right? When you think of jealousy, you think of relationships, right? I mean, I, I've taught this to the youth, and I'm, th I'm saying, you guys know what jealousy means, because they're all like, yeah, my boyfriend did this. I mean, like, every time boyfriend and girlfriend, you see that boy-girl jealousy, you see that in relationships, right? And so this term is conveying a relationship. I know all about jealousy. In fact, you could say I had a bit of a problem with it, in high school, and probably still do, but now I'm married, so it's, it's okay, <laughs> right? Because it's what I deserve. Anyways, no. Uh, je I did. I really did have a problem. When I started dating Anne Marie, uh, senior year of high school, you know, my last relationship was killed because of jealousy. I mean, it really was. It destroyed because of jealousy. We were miserable. And so, you know, I was like, this time, not going to let it happen. I'm not going to be jealous, not going to let it happen. And there was a boy that she was friends with. Right? And so I'm dating her for six months. You know, it's cool, whatever. You want to go hang out with him? Yeah, sure. Hurt me, you know? <laughs> like, go hang out with him, you know? And it got to be the point where they were hanging out a lot, and it was almost like dates. And I was like, okay, this is getting kind of not cool. Um, not really appreciating this. And I said, could you just ask him to do one thing? When, when you go out and hang out with him, could you, could you just have him call me or tell me or ask me or tell me what y'all are doing? Just make me feel more comfortable. I'm just a little nervous about this guy. Um, you know, he's in drama with you and, you know, whatever, I don't know. So, he calls me one time and says, you mind if I, you know, just go out and get some ice cream? We're going to go watch a movie, get some ice cream, and uh, we're just going to hang out. And I'm like, I, I really appreciate you asking me. You know, go hang out with her. I understand you are friends. Good boyfriend. Not jealous. Cool. Come to find out, she shows up at the, his house, and they were going to meet there, ride to the movie, and get ice cream. But he had rented a movie at their lake house with a present for her and had made dinner for her. 
You want to talk about the all-consuming fire of God? You want to talk about jealousy? I mean, like, eyes inflamed, okay? Jealousy. nah -uh, Not happening. So I, we had words, of course, right? Afterwards, I mean, I was furious because she was mine and he was getting her attention and I was so angry. And now, you know, further that, that we're married, you know, take it a, a, a bit farther, th that jealousy, why was that, what spurred on that jealousy? It was my desire for her, for her full attention, for her everything. I didn't want her to give attention to anyone else. I wanted her. Now, it, it, now that we're married, I cannot even imagine if there was ever comes a time in my life where that same instance happens. Yeah, I would be furious. I cannot imagine. What if she failed? What if, what, if, what if at that time she fell into temptation or something now that we're married? I, fury would be a huge feeling, yes. But I would be broken. Absolutely broken. Because I love her and I want her attention. See, when, when, when Moses is describing God as jealous here, it's that same type of human feeling. There's a reason that God set up relationships the way that He has done it. He set up husband and wife so that we would understand more clearly the way God feels about us. That father-son relationship so that we would understand how God feels about us. And I do understand more clearly now that I've been through the relationships that I've been through. God is jealous for you. And, and, and the unfortunate thing is that God is relational and he's so jealous for you but then Moses says you know God he's relational he's jealous for you but then look and see what you're going to do this is what you're going to do Israel and so he continues <clears throat> this is what you are going to do Israel verse 25 when you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over to the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. You know, God is relational. God is jealous and we are unfaithful. We break God's heart. We drive Him to fury because we're unfaithful. They turn to, to, to idols that they made with hands just like we do. I mean, what consumes your thoughts? What, what consumes your actions? What do you worship? Is it, is it the God of the universe? Do you have a daily working relationship with Him? Or when you wake up as the first thought, what am I going to look like today? What am I going to do today? How am I going to earn this money today? How am I going to pay this rent? How am I going to make this person see me? What's my reputation going to be today? We have idols. It may not seem as crazy as a golden calf, but we worship things over God so, so often, and we're unfaithful. And, and this is vile before God. It, I mean, Scripture even gets, gets PG-13 about it. It talks about uh, how Israel, it, it refers to them as prostitutes, as, as whores. Over and over in Scripture, it talks about how they're cheating on God. In Jeremiah 2.20, For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bow down like a whore. <laughs> Jeremiah 3.1, If a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not that land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers. And would you return to me, declares the Lord? Hosea 9.1, Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. See, God is relational. This massive, huge God, like in that song, and you sitting on a throne with the angels swirling around His head saying, Holy, holy is the Lord of God. That kind of a huge God wants to have a relationship with us. He is jealous for us. I mean, He is so deeply passionate about us, but we're unfaithful. We are. Every one of us in here is. I know I do it. 
I mean, I, that, I hold my car above God sometimes. I hold church above God. I get so caught up in building the church and, and doing the church in the right way and studying about the church and how can we be successful in churches that I forget to include God. I mean, like, God's over here on the side saying, hey, the church is about having a relationship with me. And you're focusing on the church, but not me. I, I, I'm unfaithful. I give so many other things attention than I do God. But, but the beautiful part about that is, is if I was God and I was that big and I loved people and I, I wanted them to be relational with me, I would destroy them if they cheated on me. I mean, I, I know in Scripture it says, it talks about how, you know, getting a divorce is, is, is something that you should try to stay away from and, and, and if, if my wife were to cheat on me, that I'm allowed to get a divorce, but I should still try to mend things? How in the world? Like, how hard would that be, I think about, you know? But yet, the great thing is that God, it, it, He's relational, He's jealous, we're unfaithful, but then He's merciful. Moses continues in verse 29 and says, But, and this is a beautiful word right here, But from there you will seek the Lord your God. And you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers you swore to them. Despite their unfaithfulness, Despite the fact that they constantly forget the covenant that God made, God says, I will remember the covenant. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will have mercy on you. Despite how much you've hurt me, you've broken me because of, of your cheating on me, your unfaithfulness. That's what God did through Jesus. In Hosea, we see that God tells Hosea to, to marry this prostitute, and the prostitute leaves Hosea, and God says, Hosea, go buy her back. And I'm thinking, why in the world would he tell him to do that? And God's trying to say, hey, that's exactly what I'm doing with Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 says, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus is what God used to buy us back, even though we were unfaithful. It reminds me of a, uh, a story that one of my my, my professor's told, um, pastoral ministry, he's, he's giving us all of these instances and saying, what would you do if this happened? And he said that he was in his office uh, one day. He's a pastor of a fairly large church, five or six hundred people. And uh, a member of his congregation walks into his office. Um, this member of the congregation has been serving in the church for two years. And he's a man and he's bawling. And he's just crying, and he says, I, I need to tell you something, Pastor. And the pastor says, okay, well, go ahead. What, what is it? And he said, I've been unfaithful to my wife. And, and Pastor Holmes has gone through counseling and stuff. He knows how to deal with something like this and says, okay, um, is there anything else I should know? Um, the guy goes on and says, ah, yeah, and he's crying, he's crying, he's crying. He says, I've been unfaithful more than once. And Pastor Holmes, he took this time, he said, when someone's confessing, you continue asking because they're going to confess everything. And so you need to get all the information right before you begin counseling them. And so he says, so I said again, is there anything else? The guy says, yeah, for the past 18 years with multiple partners. This guy's got kids. Um, he's serving in the church. The wife has no idea. Uh, the pastor says, okay. The guy's still crying uncontrollably. And he says, okay, is there anything else? Um, he says, yeah, with with people of both sexes. And at this point, I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to handle that as a pastor. And the pastor says, okay, is there, is there anything else? He said, yeah, um, I was caught at work today. I'm a nurse, and I got caught at work. Um, and, and I think I, 
I may have given my wife AIDS. And, and so, you know, the pastor is, is sitting there and he's like, how in the world? Because he's going through his mind. The wife has no idea. They've got children they're raising together. They, I mean, they're both serving in the church. And the, past, the pastor's saying, what are we going to do? We have to tell the wife, how is that going to look? What's that going to look like? And so, of course, the pastor goes with them. They go back to the home. They arrange for the kids to get taken by another member of the church. And they sit them down in the living room. And Pastor Holmes sits off to the side. And he's got to let the guy do it. I mean, he has to tell her. I mean, her health is involved. I mean, every, I mean he has to tell her. And so the pastor sits and the man tells her. And, and uh, Pastor Holmes said that he, he would never forget the look on her face. It was almost like if someone literally died while she was still breathing that it was just glazed over, that you could move your hand in front of her face and that she just couldn't move, couldn't function, couldn't think. I mean, could you imagine? And it broke his heart. And, and so they, they separated for a couple weeks and the, pastor, the, the woman comes to the pastor and says, I want to work it out. I, I want to I help him. I want to be with him. I, I love him so much. I don't care what he's done. What will it have to take to bring him back to where we can get this working right again? And so they start counseling, right? They start counseling and, and a few months goes by. They, they move back in together and they, they, you know, the, the wife is trying and trying and trying and six months go by and he does it again. <laughs> And at this point, you're thinking, yeah, she's gone. She's leaving. And she comes back to the pastor and says, I still love him. I want to work it out with him. Can we do something else? And so the counseling comes again. And they say, please, I, I want to be with him. It doesn't matter what he's done. I want to be with him. A few months more go goes by. He does it again. And again, she says, I love him. I want to be with him. I've made this covenant, this relationship with him that I'm trying to keep. And and." That pastor eventually has to move to a different church and he, he kind of loses contact and he, and he says that, that three years goes by and he sees the lady. And he comes up to the lady and he goes, hey, you know, how, how are things going? Is, is everything okay? And she says, uh, he's completely devoted over to that lifestyle now and we can't even find him. But I still love him and I'm praying for him. And pastor said there's two looks that I'll never forget. There's the look of, of her completely dying inside when she found out. And there's the look that day at church of a woman who completely understood the love of Christ more than he will ever understand. Because that is what Jesus Christ was. God said, I don't care if they've cheated on me. I don't care if they've messed up. I don't care if they've left. I don't care if they've served idols over and over and over again. Send Jesus. Buy them back. Get them back to me. Their relationship is, my relationship with them is more important than what they've done. I don't care where they've been, what drugs they've used, what alcohol they've used, what they've worshipped, who they've been with. I love them for who they are, no matter what. And the only way I'm going to get them back to myself is if I unleash my punishment on Jesus so they can come to me freely. Wow. That's what God did. In His love, in His jealousy, in His relational aspect, He sent Jesus to die for us. To get us back even though we were unfaithful. That, that's, that's, that's reason to live life. That's reason to, to share this gospel. That's reason... That's purpose. So today, are you neglecting this relationship that God has fought for so desperately? You know, what's your prayer life look like? Are you opening in the letter, letters He's been writing to you? Do, you? do you acknowledge that God is so relational, He's fought for it so desperately? Are you acknowledging that in your daily life? Or do we so easily forget like Israel did so many times? Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I pray, Lord, um, <clears throat> these are heavy words, God, and I, I pray that they would sink into our hearts, Lord. God, we, we worship you. We love you, God. We thank you for being a jealous God, for being a God that yearns so desperately for us, God, that you... you do not need us, God, but you want us. How beautiful, God, that, 
that you are so big and powerful. You don't need us, but you want us, Lord. We love you so much, God, for, for showing us that in your word, God. And God, we just pray that you would let that sink into our hearts, God, and that we would live our lives for that truth. God, I pray, God, that, that we would cling to you in daily life. In Jesus' name, amen.